Now at this point what I want you guys to do is I want you to open the book because we're going to start covering a few of the things that are important in distributed data processing. In fact the book covers them very well because the book, the book is going to be using robust technologies and effective methods that are going to help you create a distributed system. Okay? And we're going to be covering most of them, not all of them, because some of them have been updated. Remember, this is a book from 2006. So some of the technologies that this book uses are outdated. What are they? Like Hypersonic. Hypersonic, the database, is outdated. And it's outdated. And it's outdated. Okay? But some other technologies are still in use. And the idea in data distributed processing is to be able to integrate together all these technologies to produce a system that works. And that's exactly what you guys are going to be working on throughout the semester. Now, you just gave me an idea. Hey, I would like to do it about this subject or this theme or whatever. If I approve it, that's what you're going to be working on the rest of the semester. How? By taking all these different technologies and putting them together to work. So we're going to have a database management system. We're going to have uh, an email management system. We're going to have a web server. We're going to have a framework, an MVC pattern implementation framework. We're going to have an ORM, an object relational mapper. We're going to have all these. We're going to have Java server pages, HTML, JavaScript, all these different technologies, and we're going to put them all together and we're going to make them work. Okay. Now, the methodology that we're going to be using to create this uh, project, the, the actual development methodology is going to be what it's called extreme programming or agile development. Okay. Typically, this is done in pairs, pair of developers, but can also be done um, in a developer manager type of of structure. So I'm going to be your manager. You're going to be the developer, and you and I are going to be co helping each other through the wiki, collaborating, and in an agile development methodology we're going together going to develop this system okay this distributed system <clears throat> okay so if we go right into the first chapter of the book what the hell is a child java development can anybody tell me what that means And in fact, it has changed a little from since the book was created. Because back then, um, there were other similar methodologies called like the extreme programming or the agile model-driven model development. The agile Java development, basically what it does is you are going to do the requirement, the design, the implementation, and the test a very simple functional requirement in your system. And then you're going to deploy it. And that whole sequence of events, design, implementation, sorry, design, um, Requirement, design, implementation, and testing and deployment. The whole sequence is going to be called a sprint. Okay? Typically, you guys will be doing one sprint per week. Okay? And you will start coding, actually coding your system about fourth fifth week in the semester. The whole semester has a total of 16 weeks. That means you guys are going to be doing at least 
10 sprints. Each sprint will develop one functional requirement, fully functional requirement. That means you're going to have to do the specification, the design, the implementation, the testing, and the deployment of one functional requirement per week, starting on fifth week. All right? It's very simple work. Very simple work. <laughs> it's right. You're right. It's not complicated. It's very simple. Initially, it's going to look, it's going to feel like it's a lot of work, but you'll start cranking them easily, easier and easier every time. Now, you and I are going to go through each one of the functional requirements and we're going to prioritize them. Okay? So I will be telling you, hey, I want you to start on functional requirement three and five first. And those are the ones that you're going to be concentrating on. Typically, you want to tackle the hardest ones first. Because you know that eventually they're going to change. The specs will change, or the scope will change. Something will change in the functional requirement that you don't have to fix it right away in that first sprint. You can fix it later on when you start building the system incrementally and you start adding other functional requirements and you say, oops, maybe this functional requirement shouldn't have been done this way. And so you fix it at that stage. And this or something like that. <laughs> the 12 principles of agile development. We follow these principles. Business people and developers must work together daily throughout the project. I mean, there's a whole bunch of stuff that, yeah, they sound like pretty nice things, but they actually, when you do them, they actually come down to the stuff that we're doing on the wiki. The functional requirements, the UI sketches, the prioritization of the functional requirements, um, the, the modeling. You guys are going to have to be able to build a model of your system, a UML model. S stuff like that, okay? That is going to allow us to develop the system in an agile development fashion. Okay, so if we were actually working at a company, this will be the stage that we're at. It's called week one. And they every chapter in the book has an a hypothetical stage of the of the system. In this case, Susan and Ron. Susan I believe is the um the upper management that you know has the, all these ideas about these crazy uh, projects. <clears throat> so somehow you have played the role of, Sus of Susan this week, right? Coming up with the project that you want to build. She says, "I have approval from upper management to move forward with this with release one of this application." And Ron says, "Ron, I think is the manager for the programmer. Sounds good. I'll have my programmers, Steve and Raj." begin looking at this starting next week. They like programming software as a pair. And like I said, that's typically the case with agile development. <coughs> so, what are the different technologies that we're going to be covering this semester? The Spring Framework. Can anybody tell me what is the Spring Framework? What is it used for? And most of you have taken CSIS 3020 with me, right? Towards the end of CSIS 3020, which is basically just building a website, you guys have gotten your feet wet on something called the MVC pattern. The MVC pattern is a well-known pattern by developers and architects out there. 
that is the pattern that all big systems um, conform to so they can be easily maintainable, easily developed, and easily tested, etc., etc., and all the, the good stuff that you want to see in a robust sys distributed system. That if you develop it with that framework, it will make things easier and faster. Okay? Spring just happens to be one of those implementations. In fact, Spring it's an MVC pattern implementation written in Java. Just like Cake PHP, which is the one that we covered last semester with the CSIS 3020 students, Cake PHP is a MVC pattern implementation in PHP. There's also Rails, which is written in Ruby. And it's called Ruby on Rails. And there's a whole bunch of them. And last uh, semester I went into, I can't remember what was the website, probably it was Wikipedia. Um, and I show everybody, hey, almost every programming language today has an MVC pattern implementation. Okay? It's a framework, whether it's open source or not, that you download, you pay the uh, the fees, if you want to pay the fees for or royalties for the uh, framework, or you just download it if it's open source, and it's uh, and it's a framework that allows you to build a website fast. Okay, and that's what we're going to be doing with Spring. We're going to be downloading and using Spring as our um, web framework. It's also called inversion of control. Can anybody tell me what inversion of control stands for? See, inversion of control is a concept. It can be implemented just like the MVC pattern in many different ways. Okay. Hmm. Yeah, and also dependency injection. <clears throat> Basically, what you're trying to do is you're trying to make sure that every single entity in your system knows about itself very well, and it has very loosely coupled, very little knowledge, loosely coupled, or very little knowledge about all the other entities. By building the system that way, you are allowing plugging and plug out of different pieces of the software. And they can work together because they know very little about each other. In other words, they know just what they need to know about each other. And you are letting the framework take care of all the dependencies and that's and, and the way you do it is by injecting those dependencies into the different entities either through the constructor or through the methods okay so it's called dependency injection that's one of the things that the framework does <coughs> and instead in the case of spring instead of doing it at the code Right? Instead of doing the dependency injection at the code, it does it through an XML configuration file. So you can have all these different entities running in memory, knowing very little about each other. And with just one XML configuration, you can make them depend on each other and work together. That's the beauty of it. And right now, maybe you don't understand it, and it's up there in the air, but eventually when you see the code and we see the examples, uh, you guys are going to be able to understand how all these different entities get integrated. Are there the only, is, is that Spring Framework the only alternative? No. There are other free open source alternatives. In fact, one that comes to mind is called Struts. 
Strut is what was the predecessor of Spring. Strut is older than Spring. And Struts was one of the first MVC pattern implementations in Java. Okay. Java server faces is, is out there too. And other ones. Alright, what other technology are we going to be using? Hibernate. Hibernate. And Hibernate is an example of an object relational mapper. Okay? An object relational mapper. And we're not going to go into the Wikipedia because we know it's blocked. Wow, look at all these different implementations of object relational mapper. In fact, you know what? We could probably go into hibernate itself and find hibernate. information about it. Yep, it's hibernate.org. Wow, they have created all these different... It's amazing. So what is an object relational mapper? Anybody? What do you think an object relational mapper does? <laughs> That's the second biggest technology that we're going to be using. Now remember, these websites that you guys are creating must rely on a database. That's where you're going to persist your data. What kind of database? It's not just any database. It's a relational database management system. MySQL is a relational database management system, unlike Postgre and um, uh, what is m what is the name of that? Mongo's. Mongos, Mangos, something like that, which is object relational databases. We're not going to touch those. That's an alternative to a distributed data processing system. Less common, but it's an alternative. <coughs> We're going to be building relation, uh, a system that relies on a relational database management system like MySQL, which means it contains what? It contains tables and records. Every table contains a record of data. And there are a relationship between those tables, between keys and foreign keys. And that's stuff that I'm not going to be covering in this class because you guys should already know through your database management system course. And in fact, I cover a little bit on CSIS 3020. But a relational database does not make things easier easy for an object-oriented system. It's a system that is built in an object-oriented uh, framework. Okay? Like Java. Java is an object-oriented programming language. Why? Because it has classes, and classes have instances. When you create an instance of a class, it's an object. And that object contains data and behavior all together. It represents an entity in your system. It makes things easier for you to develop because all you have to do is mirror the reality of what you want to build with the objects in your system. And they have to behave the same way as you expect them to behave in reality. Object-oriented programming. Well, guess what? Object-oriented programming does not go well with relational. It's not a one-to-one -one thing. Hence, we had to create 
SQL, Structured Query Language. Some kind of language that allows us from the object-oriented world to communicate with the relational world. But that wasn't enough. We end up building systems that were error prone, that were difficult to, difficult to maintain, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, because we were using structured query language within the code. And somebody came up with the idea why don't we just create a framework that converts that relational database as if it were objects? In an object, in an object-oriented um, um, world, and that's how an object relational mapper framework came about. And Hibernate is one of the many. There are other ones. Almost every relational database management system company has created one. Oracle has created theirs. DB2 has created theirs. Informix, uh, all the major databases, uh, SQL Server. They have uh, Microsoft has created one for SQL Server. In fact, it comes from Hibernate as well. So this object relational mapper basically takes the burden from the programmer of knowing how to query the relational database management system with the structured query language to get the data and create the objects so that we can manipulate them in our object-oriented world, the system that we're building. It takes that burden automatically from the programmer and it just let it, lets him or her talk in objects to the database. And that's what Hibernate does. That's exactly what Hibernate is going to do. It's a persistent framework that it's an object relational mapper. Look at this. Ibatis, that's from Oracle. Okay. And the commercial, um, this is the free version or free, the open source version. Oracle Top Link is the commercial version. Okay. Now the good thing is today the Spring Source guys, the developers that created the Spring Framework, have done most of that framework integrated into Hibernate. So it's almost transparent the fact that we're using two frameworks. It looks like we're only using one Spring Framework. Okay. In fact, most of the Spring Source developers came from the Hibernate project. Anyway, we're going to be using Eclipse. You guys should already know how to do that. You probably have done it in a couple of courses before, how to create projects in Eclipse and run uh, small projects in Eclipse. Ant, we're not going to be using Ant. Ant is a packaging configuration management system outdated, we're not going to use it. Today, Maven, it's what's being used. And Maven, in fact, does more than just configuration management. It does dependency management. It does packaging. Um, packaging and deploying automatically, etc., etc. All kinds of stuff that Ant doesn't do. J unit testing, yes, we're going to be doing that. In fact, one of the stages that you're going to have to do in your sprints is going to be testing. It's the one, um, the one step before the deployment, and the deployment is going to be me. <laughs> you're going to be sending it to me. Okay. Hibernate SQL. No, we're not going to do that. We're going to do MySQL. Uh, 
Apache Tomcat, yes, that's going to be our web server. Apache Tomcat will be our web server. It's a, uh, it's an Apache web server that contains a servlet container. In other words, it's a piece of software that knows how to translate um, a server class into HTML code or a Java server page which is H HTML mixed with Java script on the server side into a servlet which is one of the classes being used in in Java okay so be, to be able to understand how that works we're gonna have to understand how a servlet works in Java when you guys took uh, what, what is it programming to do you guys see servlets? No. Didn't think so. Okay. Is that the only alternative? No. There are other alternatives, and I'm sure you guys have uh, heard of them, like WebLogic, BEA WebLogic, or WebSphere from IBM, or Coucher Resin. Or there's another one called JBoss. I don't know why it's not listed here. JBoss. They're a little bit more robust, though, than Tomcat. Because Tomcat, Apache Tomcat, is a web server with a server container. WebLogic and WebSphere's are actually application servers. And application servers handle transactions, handle security, single sign-on, and et cetera, and a whole bunch of other stuff. Okay? And then, obviously, Firefox is going to be the um, the browser that we're going to be using and forget about the open office. Or Okay, if we were to take a look at a picture in architecture, in architect, I'm sorry, will make a picture of the system that it's about to build. This will look, this will be it. This is what it will look like. Okay? What is it? We have right in here, in the middle of the picture, we have our Apache Tomcat. Apache Tomcat is going to load our project and run it our project does not work on its own does not run on its own it depends on Apache Tomcat without a top Apache Tomcat we cannot run anything which is going to be one of the problems that we're going to have in order to test our stuff that's why we're going to have to use a different framework called JUnit. JUnit is going to be a small fr testing framework that will allow us to test our code without relying on anything else, like Tomcat. Okay? So our system depends on Tomcat to run. And it's going to be broken into four pieces the controller, the model, the view, and a spring scheduler. Those are the four pieces that are going to make up our project. And you guys are going to be building something similar with those four pieces. The model view controller, you guys already have a good idea what they're for. The model is going to be the piece of the software that represents our business objects. And in fact, the model is going to be the piece that uses Hibernate to go against a database as if we were objects, grabbing objects. So the model is going to be using Hibernate as, a, as our object relational mapper to go into the database, grab data, and manipulate it as objects. Okay? Any business requirements, any business rules 
that your system, the one that you guys, the system that you guys are building, any business rules that change or have to be modified, some limits, some ranges, whatever, this is it. They go there. Those business requirements must be implemented in the model section. Okay? On the other hand, we have the view section. And the view section, we're not going to limit it to JSPs and HTML. In fact, towards the end, we're going to be building a mobile application that uses our system. Okay? We're going to be m building an Android, a very simple Android mobile application that is going to be using our system as a view. So our system will run on a browser or an Android phone. Okay? And then you have the controller piece. The controller piece is the guy in the middle that knows the flow of the of the system itself. It's the guy in the middle that knows, oh, I have been requested to do this. I know exactly who in the model section can take care of it, and I know exactly how to present it in the view section. So the controller is going to be also a key piece. In fact, the controller is going to be the starter of our system. It's the first thing that the browser or the Android touches. The controller piece. Why? Because the controller piece has a special Spring Framework class called the Dispatcher Servlet. And the dispatcher servlet is going to be our well-known point of entry into our project. In fact, Tomcat will look for a dispatcher servlet in our project in order to start the whole thing. Okay? What are going to be the protocols? The protocols are going to be HTTP protocols. You guys are already familiar with that. That's on the front end. On the back end, we're going to be using Java database connectivity. In fact, the Hibernate framework uses Java database connectivity behind the scenes to communicate with the database. That means that we're going to have to use a MySQL Java database connectivity library. Okay? And it will be part of the project when I give it to you guys. And then finally, that isolated little piece, the scheduler, the spring scheduler. You guys are going to have to build a system that somehow has tasks that run on a given day, night, at a given time, whatever, with a, a, a certain frequency every day, every week, whatever. Okay, and that's what the sc Spring Scheduler does. It actually gives you the ability to schedule a task for a specific function that nobody has to interfere with. The browser doesn't interfere with. The Android application doesn't interfere with. It just happens. And that triggers a whole bunch of events that will change the views that the browser look at or the view that the Android application look at. Okay? So the Spring Scheduler is going to be that silent piece that it has an effect on the system. Okay? Any questions? <coughs> 